Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Padma. And good morning, Prabhakaran. Welcome morning, to uh, yeah. Welcome to a hangout with space. And uh, today we are excited to have with us Dr. Padma Yanamandra Fisher, who will be joining us to talk about the great solar eclipse that's coming up in on August twenty first, uh, just this month. Uh, it's a series of talks on eclipse, and we are hoping to get in a few a few people live from there on the day, including hopefully Dr. Padma. So welcome, Dr. Padma, again and uh, I'm also happy to introduce Prabhakaran, uh, educator with space, who's sitting with us from the Chennai office. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or so, it's actually it's evening for me, but good morning yeah, good, to you. Good evening for you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, let, uh, I would like to share more about Dr. P Dr. Padma. Uh, Dr. Padma is senior research scientist at Space Science Institute. She uh, studies the nature of light scattering in various media pertaining to the solar system. Her current research focuses on seasonal and temporal changes on Jupiter and Saturn and understanding the thermophysical properties of solar system ices, including observations and models. Her observational program involves acquisition of data from various facilities such as NASA, IRTF, NOAJ Subaru, and ESO VLT. Complementary to active research, Dr. Yanamandra Fisher also participates in a lot of educational and outreach efforts. And you know, thanks to that, we, she's here with us today. Uh, she, she participates and takes forward in formal education, mentoring of students, and organizing outreach sessions at scientific meetings. And she's a reviewer of NASA educational products. She's active in the integration of social media in her outreach efforts. She's a science team member on NASA's Comet Integrated Observational Campaign and is taking forward the PACA Pro-Am Collaborative Astronomy Project. And we saw a lot of activity on that with Dr. Padma during Rosetta and ISON. Uh, Dr. Padma received her PhD from University of Denver. She did her postdoc at JPL and joined the Earth and Planetary Atmospheres Group at JPL as a research scientist. Her extracurricular activities involve travel, gardening, winemaking, and enjoying friends, and empowering people with basic knowledge via social media. She will be heading a citizen science experiment that's one of 11 ground-based experiments being supported by NASA, and her experiment is the citizen science approach to measuring the polarization of the solar corona. And we are so happy to have you here with us today, Dr. Padma. And I would like to share that, you know, I've known her for a long time. And uh, as she said, her extracurricular is making friendships. And I'm glad that we are able to touch base again uh, through being friends for a long time. And welcome here to sh share your stories with our students. So. Uh, with that, Padma, uh, Dr. Padma, can we go ahead and uh, ask you to share your uh, views and your presentation on the solar eclipse? And then I'm sh I know a lot of students are waiting so they can get to their questions after you finish with your presentation. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Mila and Prabhu for uh, such a nice introduction. Uh, like Mila said, I do know her from our elementary school days, so we go back a long ways along with our parents being colleagues. Um, also, for all that, for that many years of knowing her, this is the first time we're professionally interacting. So it's very interesting uh, uh, in collaboration today. Uh, I'm also very excited to be able to share some of the things that we were doing, uh, given the practices that we have been taking uh, for the last few months, preparing for an eclipse that's coming up in about two weeks. So I'm going to start my presentation, first of all, just to, um, in case people don't, uh, don't know me very well or want to know what my background is to be a scientist, I just want to kind of show a quick summary of my background and then jump into my presentation. So uh, if I can figure this out. I'm sorry, that's not where it should be. Uh, let's try this again. Uh, slideshow. 
All right, can you see my slide, Dr. Mila? Can you see my presentation? Uh, not Hi. yet. Okay, um, it's showing on my screen. So, oh, I uh, think I, I did share. not end. Uh, that's, I'm sorry. Technology on ground is a little hard for me to understand. Yeah. So I'm going to try this again. Yeah, telescope. <laughs> <laughs> the telescopes are easier. Okay. Um, all right. Let me try this again. Yeah, um, that's that's correct. We can just go okay, to your presentation okay. now. Yeah. All right. Can you see my first slide? Yeah, we can. Good. Okay. So I originally was going to talk a lot about my polarization experiment, but I realized uh, that I think uh, um, a glow of uh, Better and understanding would probably come about from having some good background understanding of the reason why this eclipse is so important and why people are looking at it, uh, and where and how eclipses fit in our uh, daily lives as well as our culture and society. So, I changed the title to 2017 Total Solar Eclipse. It has two components: science and citizen science. Okay. So who am I? Uh, I'm from Andhra Pradesh in India. So for the audiences that are in India, you probably will be familiar with all of this. Um, I'm sorry, it's going too fast for me. Uh, I, I attended my, my secondary school in uh, New Delhi. I went to college in New Delhi, did my ba bachelor's and master's there, came to Denver for my PhD, like Mila mentioned. And then I eventually got an MBA later on. I started my career as a postdoc at JPL, um, seeing the beautiful images sent back by Voyager spacecraft of Saturn's rings. And so from Voyager mission was the key point in my career. So I studied uh, the rings of Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. And then I eventually, as I became a senior scientist, I studied comets, uh, atmosphere of Venus, and started my own observing program. So a lot of my science came about during those years. And then I moved to a space science research, a space science institute in Boulder, Colorado, where I do a lot of other types of programs also, including pro-am collaborative astronomy and creating customized observing campaigns to uh, include amateurs as well as students as, and, and other scientists. And so these programs have included uh, various objects, solar system objects from comets to the sun. And my biggest interest, the underlying interest for all these campaigns is how does light interact with indifferent matter? So depending on whether you're studying the planetary atmospheres, comets, the planetary rings, extraplanetary systems, um, in, in even materials like solid materials like ices, or dust, or the sun, the light, scat light is uh, eventually um, modified by its interaction. And that is what I really am keen on because I, uh, by probing those kind of uh, experiments, I can understand what it comprises the uh, mechanism by which light is being scattered or how it interacts. And that tells me something about the systems I want to study. So turning to the eclipse equation, what is an eclipse? We use eclipse very loosely to mean the sun, sun and moon playing around in the sky. But it actually is a generic term, which actually means it's an astronomical event that happens in the sky where you may see it, may not see it, but where one astronomical body either passes in front or completely occults another object. So you have either a full, an eclipse or a, an occultation or a transit when it's only partially covered. So a moon passing in front of a host star or a moon like of Jupiter passing in front of another moon of Jupiter or a moon passing in front of Jupiter itself or a planet going across the disk of the sun. All of these are examples of eclipses, but we commonly use them as solar eclipse and lunar eclipse. That's the ones uh, that uh, it has kind of changed, morphed into. And so we know what those are. That is, a solar eclipse is when the moon comes between the sun and Earth, and the lunar eclipse is when the Earth comes between the sun and the moon. And all these eclipses essentially have three common parts, an umbra, which is the darkest part of the shadow of the uh, uh, eclipse, the penumbra, where you don't have uh, as dark a region, but it's lighter, and then the anti-umbra, which is not used that often, but it really means when the object that is uh, doing the occulting or occluding another object, the one that's in the middle of this geometry, it 
does it falls into the cone of the light coming from the object it's trying to occlude. And so you actually see what's called an annular, that is, you see a dark uh, shadow, and then you see a bright band around it or an annular uh, event. And so these are common to almost any eclipse, whether it's a solar, lunar, um, another type of transiting uh, feature. But focusing on solar and lunar eclipses, these are the similarities, but you can also see some of the differences here. The solar eclipse uh, basically occurs when the moon comes in between the sun and the earth, as you see in the middle uh, diagram. But it also occurs at new moon time. So there's a specific geometry. It has to be new moon. And it lasts only for a few minutes, anywhere from a few seconds to about seven minutes in, in duration. Similarly, the low, and then three types of uh, solar eclipses, total, partial, and so annular, as you see below. That is when the object, when the moon uh, obscures the sun or occults the sun exactly, uh, like it's going to do on August 12th or 21st, it's going to be a total eclipse because it's completely blocking out the disk of the sun. But when it passes by, or some people who are not in the path of totality, as we call it, they're going to see the partial eclipse, which is the first image you see at the bottom uh, left, where only part of the sun is obscured. So the sky will darken a little bit, but you don't see it completely dark. And then there are other types of eclipses that occur when uh, the moon basically uh, uh, obscures the sun, but it doesn't completely cover it. That depends on the geometry. And you see this bright uh, ribbon around it, and that's called the annular eclipse. Now, the lunar eclipses that uh, we see occur at nighttime at uh, full moon phase, and they last for a few hours, the recent one being just uh, recently on the 7th of August. And again, there are three types. There's a total, penumbral, and partial. Similar to the sun, you have the uh, umbral and the penumbral, you understand. But the, uh, the partial is when we have a mix of the two. It goes through partly through the umbra and the penumbra. In fact, the, the eclipse that occurred on August 7th, it was a partial lunar eclipse. That is, part of it went through the umbra, and part of the uh, object went through the penumbra. So it's a combination of the two. And one quirky fact that I uh, discovered, and uh, I've been kind of it's been nagging me to uh, understand if that was true, and I actually looked it up. Eclipses occur in pairs, so it, within two weeks of each other, because you have a full moon and a new moon. So the 7th of August uh, eclipse that occurred is precedes the one on the 21st by two weeks, but uh, because everybody's interested on the solar eclipse, we've been forgetting some of these other uh, interesting phenomena that occur. And so that's, uh, and that's because usually the, the orbits of Earth, and our moon, and uh, the sun are always changing a little bit. But the, there's a difference of five degrees between the plane of the orbit of the moon. That is, if you look at the uh, motion of the moon and the plane it's going in, that plane differs from the solar orbit by uh, five, uh, five degrees. And that's sufficient so that uh, you don't have a solar eclipse every month or every year, but you have it every so many months. But also when you uh, ha when they occur, they occur at points of intersection of the two orbits, or which are called the nodes. Uh, those are the and north and the south nodes. And so that's why these eclipses occur what, during what's called an eclipse season around that time frame. And around that time frame, you have both the new and the full moon. So you see these in pairs. And for uh, for people in India and uh, you know for um, Indian mythological background who enjoy that, uh, you know, we know that it, in ancient scriptures, they always called Navagrahas or nine celestial wanderers. And two of the wanderers are Rahu and Ketu from Hindu mythology. It's supposed to be a serpent, essentially one. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into the whole story of it, but uh, it's essentially uh, 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 one of the demons that was uh, uh, immortalized. Uh, and so you have a head and a tail of the demon coinciding with the rising of the north node and the south node of the uh, of the moon which corresponds to the where the eclipses occur so it's like one swallows the sun and the other swallows the moon and so i just found these uh, interesting graphics uh, that some artist had made uh, and so i, I try to uh, uh, put them there just to give a context to connect mythology with science but uh, the fact that uh, 
these points of intersection were formulated even before one knew the exact science of eclipses is interesting to note. And secondly, uh, the two other images that you see down here are of the moon on the 7th of August, the partial eclipse. Uh, one of them was, I think, an A-part picture, and the one on the right is taken by our Prabhu here. Um, he basically took the picture of uh, the International Space Station going across the moon. I am sorry I didn't uh, get the details of uh, how he did that, but maybe Prabhu can maybe give, give us a one-line, uh, two minutes uh, uh, explanation of this image. Can you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. On seventh of on seventh of August, exactly at eleven forty eight uh, p.m. IST, uh, International Space Station transited in front of the moon. So we had to travel to Andhra Pradesh uh, near Sri uh, mm. to to capture it at the, exactly at the right moment and the right time. And we did arrive exactly at the right time and at the right place. And we captured with the sixteen inch Dobsonian telescope with a mobile camera handheld. And we took a video and we segregated all the photograph all the frames of the video and we pasted one over other to produce this output. And it was a wonderful experience. And it's a wonderful image too. So you know, so it shows you how beautiful eclipses are, whether they be of the sun or the moon. And the ones of the moon occur more frequently. And so when you have these transit occur occurring, this is also an eclipse of the uh, occurring in a format in a certain format, which is the uh, ISS is going in front, and so they essentially take pictures of it in a time lapse frame uh, format and put them together. So, so anyway, so it, now that this has occurred within two weeks, we're going to be heading towards the great total eclipse. And why is it called the great total eclipse, and why the hype? Uh, we know that this eclipse is going to occur many years ago. Uh, the reason it's very interesting is uh, the primary reason I think it's interesting is one, um, solar eclipses occur once every 16 to 18 months somewhere in the world, but most of the time they're over water. So this is an expensive uh, expedition to go see a total eclipse. Uh, but this one, it's the first time in almost 99 years that it's going to be across a huge mass of land from the west coast of the United States to the right, uh, the east coast. And so that's quite a few, uh, that's a long path. And with the, the infrastructure in the US, it, there are a lot of people that can actually travel to it within a day or even half a day. And it's much less work compared to for planning for a cruise and carrying a lot of equipment. Here you can do that, but you can drive to pretty much any location, and this is a long path. And so there are a lot of people looking forward to this. And the second thing is that um, the fact that it is the first time in 99 years, so almost in a century, that this is going to be over land and over the continental United States, it's very exciting, it's very uh, promising, and there are a lot of people who are going to be seeing a total eclipse for the first time, uh, including me. And so it's a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, very young people are, you know, are uh, they remember it forever, and some of them get into science because of that. And a lot of people who haven't seen an eclipse so far in their lives are going to see it, and they don't have to be a scientist. They just go to the path of totality where it's completely dark, and you can look up for two minutes, uh, and for two and a half minutes in some locations, the sun is going to be obscured by the moon, and so it's going to be a very unique experience. Uh, secondly, and, uh, well, I've written all the reasons why it's very uh, interesting, and the, also there are a lot of potential for a lot of experiments. Many experiments have been organized over the years, and they're all being practiced so far. And hopefully there will be many interesting experiments like balloon launches so you can see the eclipse from uh, looking down onto the ground. Uh, there are going to be other experiments uh, for biologists to understand how the uh, environment changes. Uh, looking at the eclipse, uh, the uh, so total solar eclipse, the corona or the sun in multiple wavelengths. Uh, so And also there's lots of potential for public uh, and uh, citizen scientist involvement, especially in the U.S. There's a lot of experiments going on and a lot of people who can collect data simply, um, like for example, there's one called GLOBE, where you essentially just record the temperature and uh, uh, atmosphere temp temperature and uh, uh, the conditions of light and all that. And that goes into a database, so you can actually, uh, you know, this is an experiment that studies the interaction of the sky uh, and the light pollution, things like that. But here it's uh, uniquely customized for the eclipse. 
social media since it's uh, 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 it's uh, only been around for what 15 20 years at most so this is going to be amazing to uh, connect people from around the world even those that cannot be here to see what we are seeing and to be able to share the uh, uniqueness of this event and also it, you know since i uh, as i mentioned a total solar eclipse occurs once every 16 to 18 months and it can be anywhere around the world most of the time it's over the water simply because the earth is covered by water so much but in 2024 there's going to be another transcontinental eclipse which is not shown on this graph but it goes from canada uh, mexico all the way through the uh, the us to canada and it's going to be almost almost orthogonal to this but it passes through a couple of cities that uh, uh, it, this current one will pass through and so it's almost like uh, this could be not only is it exciting in its own right, but this is also a precursor for the next continental eclipse that's going to occur. That's a rarity in itself. And so seven years later, the, the, the young children that see it today are going to be either middle school children or college students. And so you really have a way of bringing a lot of uh, students into the science paths. But also, it's uh, unique to have two total uh, transcontinental eclipses occurring in the same landmass. And so this is a very great uh, uh, event, and that's why people have been uh, practicing. That's why people are practicing and uh, ensuring that all these experiments that we're designing cover all the, the various ranges of uh, uh, questions that you can arise from the social side, from uh, a ge uh, biological side, from this earth science side, from solar study side. So there's a lot of, and, and then as innovative uh, new instruments come along then there'll be an opportunity for new type of uh, science too. So one of the big resources, um, there is so much information, good, bad, and uh, uh, false out there. But one of the best research resources is this website, eclipse2017.nasa.gov, where they keep adding a lot of information. There are a lot of downloadable files. So even if people are not actually present and participating, you can still learn a lot about this event. And this could be applied to almost any eclipse that happens in any other location, maybe not exactly the same experiments, but you can still get a lot of the background information and uh, how to plan. So I, I'm sorry, am I, I'm, my computer is very sensitive, so it jumps around. So, but the one thing that we do emphasize in all these presentations, as well as in talks we are giving, is eye safety first, because as you have been taught, um, and this is mostly for the people participating in the United States, we tell them eye safety first because you can, you're asked not to look at the sun directly. Even your sunglasses are not sufficient. There's a, there are special sun, uh, eclipse viewers that are uh, NASA and Google and a lot of other companies and uh, teams have been uh, uh, giving out for free as well as uh, <clears throat> there now there are a lot of websites where you can buy them. But those have the, uh, they have the proper material that's been used to create these viewers so that you do not damage your eyes when you look at the sun. The only time one can look at the sun, and this is a little important fact, but it's a very uh, important to realize that that is the only time to look at the sun is during totality. That is when the sun is completely obscured by the moon. That is the only time because there is no sunlight that is escaping that will, uh, uh, you know, can burn your retina. So eye safety is first. You can look at the sun, but only during totality. And this is a theme that we try to uh, impress upon a lot of people. But the the uh, atlas, the the map I have here shows a lot of information. It shows not only the continental United States. But it shows the path of totality that starts here and tells you roughly how long the duration of totality is, that is, how long the sun will be obscured by the moon. And it also tells you these lines tell you the partial solar eclipse, that is, how much of the sun will be obscured in the partial eclipse that people can see. So most of the country will see some form of partial solar eclipse. The total eclipse is limited to this yellow band here, the center line being where the uh, totality occurs. And then on each side, for about 35 uh, miles each side, so it's a swath of 70 mile wide swath, you can see it, the totality, but you get to the edge of totality. And so some people say, oh, you know, I, I can see 99%, per, and so I don't have to go to the path. To if they can, we recommend people do go to the path of totality because the difference between 
and 100% is the fact that you won't see one part of the atmosphere called the corona, which you only see during uh, totality. And that is the beauty of uh, a total solar eclipse. For example, here's an image that I, uh, uh, I borrowed from uh, the internet, which uh, actually taken a few years back. And it shows during uh, one of the, uh, the total solar eclipses that occurred, this faint tenuous gossamer uh, features around here is called the corona, and it is visible only during a total solar eclipse, not at 99%, not at 99.9%, .9%, but at 100%. So this is one of the main reasons, and since the sun uh, uh, activity level changes, so does the structures in the corona. So therefore, you may not see the corona looking like this. It could look something different this time around. So you know, this is one of the reasons once you see a total solar eclipse, many people are hooked on it. And a lot of people actually go and make an effort to see any as many solar eclipses as they can, total solar eclipses. So in this case, this, this is a great uh, segue here to basically uh, understand science and citizen science. This is one of the, uh, I think, one of the uh, uh, first major campaigns where you have both these aspects working in parallel. And also, you also have a comprehensive study of the sun and also a study of the Earth system and response to the solar, uh, solar eclipse, both by scientists as well as educators as well as citizen scientists. And so I listed a list of uh, various uh, goals for the comprehensive study of the sun. Uh, I'm not going to read every single one of them. But the important one here is how uh, not only uh, we can look for other f uh, features on the uh, on the corona but what are the structures that we're going to see we can't predict what the corona is going to look like we can anticipate but we, we cannot predict so that's one of the uh, reasons and secondly uh, on the response of the earth system this is where a lot of citizen scientists are getting involved because there are a lot of people who are participating and so they're uh, for example, a project called GLOBE is actually asking people to um, monitor changes in temperature, how the clouds change. Is there a wind that happens? Sometimes there is a wind that occurs as a, you're heading towards totality. Uh, the plants, birds around you, they all respond differently. Uh, in people themselves, especially if they're first timers to uh, seeing a total solar eclipse, their emotions, the feelings they have, everything changes dramatically. And also, there's possibility of having uh, seeing aurora for at the right latitudes. So all of these are all uh, uh, experiments that many of the people participating are doing this for as volunteers essentially. And so that's the citizen science at its best. And then some may be looking at the map to see if there are any kind of impacts. Uh, and also, and uh, and one of the most unique uh, events I think apart from all these wonderful sciences that are going to be done, is a Citizen Kate uh, experiment, which actually has a foot in each camp. It is actually getting science, but it's also utilizing a lot of uh, 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 teachers, prof uh, professors, uh, students, and sci other scientists and amateurs also to create a path of 70 identical telescopes along the path of totality so that the event the totality for us is going to be about two minutes and 40 seconds um, at any location. But instead of taking data only for two minutes and 40 seconds, when you have 70 telescopes along the entire path, taking that much data, it eventually, and you put it all together, then this totality event will become a 90 minute event. So you get a lot more data and you can actually look for variations in the corona on short time scales. You can compare it to legacy data or data from before to see how the structures have changed. And also correlated with the activity of the sun itself to see if every time the activity of the sun increases or decreases, whether the structures change and if there's any repeatability. Um, we, I haven't seen anything like that yet, but that is something to look forward to. In 2024, the location that I'm going to be at, Carbondale, Illinois, is going to have the 2024 eclipse go through the same location. So I, it would be an opportunity to look at how the corona changes in seven years at the, no, with the, looking from the same location. Right now, the sun is going towards low activity. In 2024, it will be increasing in activity. So you have two different types of activities happening on the sun. And so there's a lot of comparative science that can be done 
2024. But even before that, we have all of this other work to do. And so Citizen Kate, along with uh, um, I, tweaking it to the point I have an independent measurement using the Citizen Kate framework, I think has changed the paradigm and the time domain astronomy uh, aspect of it so that this is actually uh, inviting a lot of the people who are just informal public, uh, people who have as, uh, telescopes or amateurs and want to be part of a campaign, can follow, we can defi def uh, define a consistent method and a procedure that if everybody follows, you get the same type of data sets. And by putting that data set together, we can actually crowdsource it to the scientists, and we actually get science out of it. So it's the best of both worlds, and it's a win-win situation. And so my, I'm not going to spend too much time on this part of it, but this is where this is the crux of my experiment is I'm going to be studying the solar corona, which is a real, uh, observable only during uh, the solar uh, the tot totality. And the corona is really the uh, extension of the atmosphere. So uh, essentially, if you look at this image, the white ball is what you see as a visible surface of the uh, sun. And so this edge here is you have the photosphere, the chromosphere, and then the small transition zone. But then all of this tenuous gossamer uh, feature here is the corona, and you can have other structures in it. You can have these streamers. You can have a, a bright band around it. You can have these other corona going on. There could be sunspots on the disk. All of those are around the temperature of 5,000 degrees or so, but the corona as you go away from the surface and farther and farther, it heats up almost to a million degrees. And that's very counterintuitive. It's as you go away from a hot object, the temperature should fall. But here, it's actually increasing. And so that the source of that heating uh, is not known yet. And that's a very fundamental, unanswered, basic solar physics question. And so we are going to try to do the science to understand, do the appropriate measurements to understand the science of it, but also utilizing the Kate pro project, having 70 telescopes look at it, we get a lot of data for this event so that we can actually get more data to study. And the farther you go, as the corona increases in temperature, it starts losing material. The gravitational field cannot hold it here. And so it becomes solar wind as those uh, particles, the ionized particles from the corona, then head out into space. And then they interact with the planets. And like at Earth, it becomes space weather. So it can impact our daily lives, depending on uh, what kind of features that come and interact with the magnetic sphere and uh, of our planet. So they're, depending on where you're studying, which part of the corona, the solar wind you're studying, there is a different process that's going on. But we still don't know what causes this extra heating of the uh, of this corona. And so that's what I'm going to be studying, is trying to understand and find evidence of uh, what uh, probably could give rise to that increased heating. And so the corona in itself has multiple components called the K corona, F corona, E corona, and there's a fourth one called T corona. My focus is on the K corona or the continuum corona because as you see in this diagram, even though it doesn't show the different parts of it, it is the part region of the corona that's very, very close to the surface or the visible surface of the sun. Uh, it is made up, it's composed of free electrons. So if you know the uh, structure of a molecule, you have a nucleus with uh, protons and neutrons, and then, then uh, electrons are in orbits. And when you pull them off, they become ion, they're ionized particles, they're negative particles. And so when light that comes from the surface of the sun uh, interacts with the electrons, it scatters that light towards the observer. And the light that comes to me is polarized. And polarization is essentially an inherent property of uh, any wave that uh, changes its state when it interacts with medium, any kind of medium. And that is the crux of my, my study, as well as the uh, crux of the experiment that I want to do. And I'm going to be doing that. So here's a plot of basically showing how uh, the intensity for the different parts of the corona as you go away from the center of the sun varies. And so I'm going to be looking at the sky during totality. So here is where the that's how bright it is. Compared to that, this is a tar typical sky when you have a bright sky. Um, when you have very good seeing, you can uh, come down to this level. And then these are the various parts of the corona. But I'm looking at this low region. So it's a very faint feature. But uh, one interesting point is, um, 
being full moon uh, for us on the western side of the world we saw a full moon while uh, the eastern side saw a partial lunar eclipse but the brightness of the full moon is the equivalent of the brightness of the corona so that's how bright the corona is but because when the sun is so bright and you're seeing mostly the sun you, the corona is not easily uh, observable so that's what makes the experiment very, very complicated, only because you have to have complete obscuration of the bright disk. You have to have, uh, you have the geometry has to be such, and you have to have an equipment that's sensitive enough to measure this polarization. And then you have to have models that people are developing from which you can extract as, uh, the distribution of electrons. You may not necessarily have the same distribution of electrons from uh, one eclipse to the other. And all of these then try to, you try to figure out what uh, how it increases the temperature, but where does the energy come from? How does it heat it? Is it homogeneous heating? Is it heterogeneous heating? And so those are questions that we don't know yet, and we start, uh, our experiment will help getting the data towards the understanding those models. So here I'm going to basically uh, use uh, show some nice graphics of what the coronal structure looks like. We do have, there are several NASA assets, a spacecraft around the sun, and they observe the sun too. But to see some of these structures, uh, like the ones in the orange here, they essentially have to block the sun's disk, so what with an occulting disk. And when they do that, they obscure not just the disk of the sun, but they, uh, they obscure some part of the corona, which is the region that I want to study. And it's hard to see that region. So basically, you have all this structure coming from uh, images taken by the spacecraft. And then you have images of the sun taken by other spacecraft or when you have an eclipse or an occulting disk, you block that out. And then here, the white uh, image, Im white part of the images, that's the uh, corona taken from the ground. And this is available only during total solar eclipse and from ground. So that's a unique uh, window that we can uh, provide good information on. And you can see that the structure doesn't look the same between different uh, uh, time periods of 2016 and 2006 and 2016, 10 years later. And you can see the structures are also all around the sun in many, many different directions. So the structure changes, the brightness changes, and all, you know, so you had to put this as a composite. And here's, uh, uh, on the right side, the pair of images here in blue background shows from a true solar, uh, true total solar eclipses, that when it, the sun was at maximum brightness, you see this kind of beautiful structure, almost like petal-like, or sometimes you'll just see a, like a band, or like a crown. And then at the solar minimum, when the activity on the sun is very so low, you see these helmet streamers, because they look like little helmet streamers, and they, they go long distances. But it's not a uniform. Uh, they're, in locate, they're restricted to certain regions. And so your structure becomes a lot more vivid, but uh, you know less uh, uh, as com less copious as compared to our maximum activity. And so to, since we are heading towards a minimum, the solar activity is going to be reducing to maybe 2020, 2019, 2020. So we are expecting to see something with streamers. But you know, there could be storms, there could be prominences, there could be other features that might, might show up. So I hope to be surprised, but uh, we're kind of anticipating we'll see structures like uh, these kind of streamers because they're going towards low activity. And so that's why the polarization of the uh, solar eclipse uh, is very important. And that's the reason uh, we partnered with the Citizen Kate experiment. So it reduces a lot of the, we share the resources in terms of uh, I, the, um, the design of the telescope, as well as how the data is being uh, uh, reduced. And so we share, because we share those resources, the learning curve is uh, less steep. And we can actually, um, oh, I don't know what happened. Um, am I still there? No, the presentation is. OK. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, is back. It back? it's back. Yeah. OK, sorry. OK, so therefore, uh, I'm not, this is very technical. Uh, it was my, for another talk, but uh, you know, it, it's important to understand the region that we're looking at, why we're looking at it, and why we are partnering. And so this is a sample data set from uh, a, a, a legacy data set that was taken in 1998, where there's a total solar eclipse. And this was taken from uh, Car Carasau, uh, Venezuela, by one of the team, our team members who 
basically built a, tel a polarimeter, as we call it, to, uh, to measure the polarization of the electrons. And so essentially what we see here is the total intensity. And then when you understand how uh, the scattering by the electrons, it polarizes it. So you have to know the, how much polarization of the light, the state has changed. And that's this image. When you multiply the intensity image with that, you get this polarized brightness. So you can see the using the colors as a, uh, gradations of temperature or uh, brightness, that it's not uniform, it's heterogeneous. And so this is important because even though it looks like a pretty picture, it contains a lot of science in it so that if you, uh, the modelers can then actually go in and we can extract how many electrons you have along the line of sight, that is along the line that you're looking at, how many objects, how many ele free electrons are there. And that gives us an idea of whether there's a concentration of electrons and maybe they somehow increase the energy deposition in the outer corona we don't know that but these are the types of maps we will be creating with our data that the modelers can then crowdsource to see uh, get some inf information about this coronal heating and so this is what we are looking forward to in terms of our data but using the same telescopes uh, with, uh, as citizen Kate and how are we partnering it uh, we're basically partnering by, uh, this is the path of totality with all these little yellow dots being a site for Kate experiment. And so the two blue stars in Teutonia, Idaho, and Carbondale, they're slightly off here in Illinois, are the two points where we're going to have a two site, uh, two -site uh, network of, for polarization. So if this works then for 2024, we can actually have more uh, polarimeters tied to Kate uh, uh, telescopes and be able to get that data. And so this is how we are partnering built on the framework of Citizen Kate. So that's why, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Citizen Kate is, uh, has a foot in both sides, one on the science as well as on the citizen science part. And so we can actually use the students, the teachers, the professionals, other scientists to get us more data than we can by going to one or two locations. And so the the experiment that we had, the two sites, that's funded by NASA and uh, Citizen Kate is funded by both NASA and National Science Foundation. And so this is a very exciting way of uh, looking at a, a, a astronomical event. And we are hoping that's gonna be the way of the future. And so this is just telling you what the what I just said in a words in a slide, the advantages of a multi-site polarimetric network. But then the one point is, is polarization that unique? And the answer is no. Uh, it's just that the human eye is not uh, po sensitive to polarization like other creatures are, like uh, bats, uh, octopus. And so we don't see uh, uh, we don't see polarization in nature unless it manifests itself like rainbows or glories and from studying those we can actually determine if ice crystals give rise to halos and uh, water droplets give rise to uh, rainbows but you can also determine the size of the rainbow uh, of the particles and where they are by depending on whether you see the primary or the secondary rainbow so and then you see glories which are or diffraction patterns by spherical particles, so you can determine the size distribution. And these are uh, these are observed and measured on in the atmospheres of other planets because they are at a different phase angle compared to us looking directly at the sun and back, which is at a certain uh, angular measurement. But spacecraft are in orbit or they're flying by, and so they get it at a range of different angles. And so we learn more about our the planetary atmospheres in our own uh, system. So polarization is not such a unique item, but it is something that's not uh, pre prevalently used. Uh, so and it's now starting to show, a re uh, people are starting to use that feature now because you have to develop models, you have to develop uh, sensitive uh, uh, detectors. So each one of these aspects occurs, uh, shows uh, uh, progress at different uh, time time frames. And so now we are at a point where you can use all these and actually study polarization regularly. So like I said, is the polarization unique? No. In 2015, there was a total eclipse of the moon that I observed from uh, the Japanese observatory, and this was the path of it. And we observed in uh, polarized light, and we could actually identify the what's called the red edge, which indicates the vegetation on Earth, because on the in a full moon and a partial um, moon eclipse, what you see is uh, Earth shine. And from the Earth shine, you can extract information about the planet. So you're, in a, in a way, you're 
uh, you're exploring extrasolar planets also by uh, understanding how to use polarization as a tool and during eclip eclipses it's a great way to uh, study the uh, atmosphere as well as what's in the atmosphere of another planet you see it in planets in aurora on different planets in comets uh, these are exoplanets here, and these are basically, this is Jupiter that shows different polarization because there's a haze particle, and the haze particles are different. And here we see jets and Enceladus that uh, Cassini spacecraft discovered. And that, again, is water drops, but, uh, you, you know, polarization would certainly help you get more information about the uh, size of particles. And these are from comets that they also show structures and there's a lot of dust in them but there's a light scattering again the light that interacts and reflects and comes back to the observer contains this information so you can extract a lot of uh, physical nature of your subject by studying this so in summary this is a uh, our summary basically it there's a we have a beautiful uh, total eclipse that's going to be coming pretty soon in two weeks and along the path of totality we're going to be in two locations uh in partnering with uh, citizen kate we're going to look at polarization uh this is our collaboration with the uh, packup project as we call it we're looking for different forms of um, uh, data called the polarized brightness and degree of polarization to get a uh, derive the heterogeneous distribution of electrons in the sol lower solar corona. And then uh, from that, we want to be able to uh, determine what the K corona looks like. Uh, and in the future, um, even though the spacecraft right now aren't capable of doing this, the, so the Parker Solar Probe is supposed to be launched in 2018. And it is supposed to be able to look into the closed regions. So we may be able to get more data about that part of the corona that we have. We can't normally unless we have a total solar eclipse. And in future, not only do we, this is our uh, eclipse of 2012 that we're, 2017 that we're um, waiting for. But in seven years, you may have 2024, April 8th. That's the uh springtime and that's again it's going to be a transcontinental and it'll cross in this point carbondale illinois and then 2042 i believe is another continental one it'll be almost parallel to the 2017 which will go through northern california but it again crosses a lot of the united states so yeah. so there are these three eclipses and there are many others in different parts of the world so it's not that there aren't other eclipses the reason these are exciting is because they cross a huge land mass and this one especially 2017 and 2024 in carbondale they're going to be two eclipses in the same location which is extremely rare and i do know there are a lot of uh, amateur astronomers from india that are coming to carbondale so i'm looking forward to meeting up with them also so at this point i'm going to stop and uh, uh, turn it over to mila uh, for questions, or I, I don't know if I went over time, but if I did, I apologize. Yeah, uh, thank you, Padma. And you know, that was great. We, we got to know a lot about what's going to happen. And I know a lot of students are waiting. So, Prabhu, will you take us forward to some questions? Definitely. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Padma. And we have all enjoyed thank it. You. We learned many things. And we have around uh, hundreds of questions. And I'm going to ask you <laughs> one by one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, the first question uh, is from Puri from KRM uh, school. What are the advantages and disadvantages of solar eclipse? Uh, advantages of solar eclipse, um, you know, basically to understand our solar system, we need to understand the different parts of the solar system. We can't always go to every single object. And so when nature puts on a show and actually becomes our laboratory via solar eclipses or any form of eclipse, we learn about both the object that is being eclipsed as well as how we interact or how Earth, uh, we interact with the, with, the, uh, with the event. And also to understand how ex other ex uh, extrasolar systems work, we need to know how our star works. And so this gives us information about the form, the different parts of the atmospheric, uh, the atmosphere of the sun, with the various experiments we do. And the disadvantages is that um, since sometimes when uh, uh, storms from the sun come and they interact with the magnetis magnetosphere of our of our planet, it disrupts our our own grid and, and you know various forms of communication we have. So. Even though we know that happens, we haven't yet uh, 
put a system in place where we can warn for warn people in advance of uh, some some other things that are going to be damaged and how to take care of that or how to anticipate those uh, uh, changes. And so there are those disadvantages, um, but I think it's a one can look at it as a disadvantage or one can look at it as an opportunity to learn more and explore. Uh, and so it, science progresses by explorations. So what we consider a, a disadvantage may be a challenge for us to improve and do better science uh, to improve our own lifestyle. Thank you so much, ma'am. And the next question is from Gautam from GD Goenka Public School. His question is, are the effects of total solar eclipse, as you told, on flora and fauna benefiting us or just reducing the lifetime on Earth? Well, um, well, the first thing is, you know, uh, our our system on Earth, our atmospheric system, as well as our own biosphere, is interrelated. And I think so we didn't realize all of that until some of these effects are seen. Um, also, like for farmers, they can take precautions if their animals are, are upset or how they behave. Their behave pattern changes. <clears throat> Nocturnal animals become more active, and so you know there may be ways that uh, some of these uh, uh, the reactions can be mitigated for uh, for situations where it actually impacts the livelihood or the uh, lifestyle of some people. To me, I think. It's an interesting to see <clears throat> it, it, it reinforces the fact that we have a diurnal cycle and it reinforces that fact because when you see these uh, creatures that are nighttime uh, nocturnal creatures, they come they become very active as soon as the, sun, uh, the sky darkens. And uh, personally, I think it's just uh, interesting to see how we all, our diurnal circles so, are so dependent on the sun that uh, a small change in that makes us change our own habits. So for me, that's an interesting thing to learn. Um, but I think uh, it, for some some places in rural areas, that could be important. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Amiti International School. Why don't we have eclipses every month? Um, part of the reason is that eclipses occur whenever, the, well, let, let me back up, the orbits of the sun and the moon are not, uh, they don't, they're not parallel. Uh, so they interact, they're five degrees uh, uh, from each other. So therefore, for the eclipses to occur, all of these have to be in the same plane. And so most of the time they're not. And when they are, that uh, when the, the geometry that gives you the eclipse only occurs at so many, uh, at so many month intervals. And that's the reason that you don't get an eclipse every month. If if the sun, the moon, and the earth are in the same ecliptic plane, then yes, you would get a, a every month you would get an eclipse. Okay. Thank you so much. The next question is from St. John's Public School, Chennai. Uh, the question is from Aditya. Would there be any temperature changes when the eclipse occurs? Yes, actually, um, you know, you have a hot body that's turning off. So as it cools, the temperature, the, your local temperature should uh, drop. And in fact, uh, I think one of the ways, um, uh, even though you're, um, you're in India, I, one of the ways that the student can verify that is maybe log into Globe uh, application and see what the results look like from people who are collecting that information in the US. And yes, the temperature does drop when the different uh, phases of the uh, eclipse occur, that is when the moon uh, first starts obs uh, obscuring the sun to when it totally obscures the sun, people do measure that and they find that the temperature drops to a minimum and then starts increasing as the temp uh, as the moon moves across and the sun is uh, revealed again. And so you do expect uh, a change in temperature, a decrease in temperature. Sometimes uh, the clouds clear. If it's cloudy, sometimes the clouds disappear. Uh, I know historically, uh, Sir Edmund Halley, the famous uh, discoverer of Comet Halley, did an experiment where he actually measured that there was uh, the wind picks up. For it was called the uh, ghost, ghostly wind, but it turns out to be a real effect, and that happens during uh, uh, an eclipse. And people do ha have measured. And in fact, in uh, in the UK. A few years back when they had a partial solar eclipse, they had a citizen science experiment where the citizens were actually measuring the temperature at the lo their location and they found that it changes. Thank you, ma'am. 
Uh, the next question is from Aditya from Indra Prasad School, Dwarka. If Jupiter has 67 moons, and then are there 67 eclipses happening by year? Um, I don't believe so, but there are. Uh, there's a time period when you the geometry of the inner Galilean, the Galilean moons, the four famous Galilean moons, they do have what's called mutual events. So they pass in front of each other. And when that happens, it happens every so many years. Um, I forget what the probably nine or ten years, I guess, are a schedule. They happen in such rapidity that there, there are campaigns, actually, uh, student uh, people who study small planets, small objects, uh, and satellites, they actually have campaigns that uh, uh, measure the uh, uh, the mutual events simply because that determines the uh, the, the diameter of the uh, uh, the satellite. And so uh, there are people who actually do a lot of astrometry as well as uh, observe those uh, satellites, and. For 67 moons, you have to have the geometry of all those orbits uh, aligned rather well. So I don't think all 67 have them, but and also you have to have the orbits have to be in commensuration with each other so that uh, the certain pairing of uh, moons will have those mutual events occur. But yes, thank they you. do have. And, thank uh, you. And Padma, uh, you can we request you to stay for another, you know, five ten minutes, although we. Uh, reach the end of time because sure. we still have a lot of questions remaining okay okay sure Thanks. you Thank know you. what um if i could i what i forgot in my slides since i didn't have a time to take a picture of the uh, unit i'm using i'm about to ship my telescope off to my the location where i'm going to do my final and uh, official science experiment but i just wanted to show what a citizen kate telescope looks like i don't know if you can see all of it and this is the main part of it this is the telescope uh, the optical tube that and then back here is our camera that's the common to all 70 sites as well as my experiment the only difference between my experiment and citizen kate experiment is this is the polarimeter this is where we're going to get the information about the polarization of the solar electrons and so this is what all 70 sites have is the identical equipment and we have identical uh, software. So this is why the power of Citizen Kate is great because you're getting, it increases the data set by that much. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to share what the telescope looks like. Well, a lot of amateurs are very interested in many of them already use their own telescopes, but uh, you know, Change, becoming from professional to an amateur telescope uh, uh, operator was very, very tough for me. Believe me, I, they do a lot. They study and they know a lot more than I do, and so it was amazing how much I had to learn from the amateurs. And there's nothing, uh, you know. I think uh, professionals have it a little too easy because we have so many people to support our network or our experiments. But this has been a wonderful uh, journey so far. Uh, can I ask the next question, then? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. The next question is from Akshay from KRM School. Will the total solar eclipse affect the power generation of solar panels? Um, you know, I'm not sure. It might only if there are any kind of uh, storms. Um, about two weeks ago, there were some uh, uh, flares and storms, but I'm not sure they impacted Earth. But uh, that's when it's going to happen. That's what space weather is all about, and that's where it's a uh, becoming more and more important to understand how the uh, how the solar wind and impacts our uh, our own planet so as far as i know i don't think so but uh, i'm not an expert on that sorry oh. well, the next question is from udkast ja does gravitational force of the sun and moon affect earth during the eclipse i'm not sure that matters much because the sun uh, gravity is going to be the sun gravity the moon basically affects our tides of the oceans on our planet so the two just being in front of each other i don't think makes much difference oh. and um, the next question is from dv public school what would be the radius of the corona during uh, the total solar eclipse well, you know, the corona stretches from anywhere uh, from one just um, just outside the boundary of the sun to millions of miles into space. So there is no set, um, I guess, there's no set uh, radius for the uh, 
corona, but what you one can define is the uh, the boundary at which it transitions from being the corona to the solar wind, and also their features, the like those helmet features, uh, streamers that we may be seeing this year, this uh, eclipse. Those might stretch into millions of miles, so I'm not sure. It depends. I have seen some that have rain, um, are, have been uh, uh, identified as being a, maybe close to uh, several millions of miles, but that could be wrong. Again, it depends on the activity, it depends on the features, so we don't have enough data to do that, and also somebody has to be able to just image the uh, corona that far out and most of us tend to uh, focus on the inner corona so i don't know exactly what would be a deterministic uh, radius but um, we'll find out when this one I, again i mean at, when the sun is at maximum activity you see a very defined band of brightness or corona around the sun but there are structures that do actually extend far out. So if I can image maybe two solar radii and I see the structure, I'd be very happy. And there are some who might uh, image even farther than that. OK. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. The next question is from uh, Bharati Shah. Akshay from uh, uh, class 9 from Ruk Rukmini Devi School. What is the path of totality? um does is the question what yeah. is the means, find as a and what stage the oh, totality is pausing i see um if i could uh, go back to my uh, can i go back to my presentation just to pull up that map um you can go ahead okay okay let me see if i can okay all right. Here's the here's the path of totality. It starts in Oregon. It goes through 14 states in the U.S., and the path of totality is a very narrow, narrow region where you, the sun is completely obscured. Uh, on either side, about 35 miles on either side, so there's a total width of this path that I show here is 70 miles, and that is where you basically um, uh, uh, the um, you don't have to be exactly on the center line for totality. You can be within plus minus 35 miles from it to see totality. And that's what this dark uh, band shows. And so it starts in, uh, um, sorry, it's, uh, it's, it starts in uh, over the ocean, but uh, comes onto land in Oregon and then goes to Idaho. Um, I believe this is um, uh, so, uh, South, Dick no, this is, uh, Montana. I'm sorry if I forget this one. Uh, there's Idaho, and then there's uh, Wyoming, Nebraska, um, Saint uh, Missouri, Illinois, Tennessee, and I think there's Kentucky, uh, a little bit of North Carolina, and South Carolina. So all in all, there are 14 states from the west coast to the east coast of the, of the uh, United States for this totality. So Thank I you, hope that's what the question was. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. And um, the next question is from Amity International School. Uh, please explain why the to total solar eclipse in August 2017 starts on the west coast and progresses eastward. Well, for solar eclipses, essentially that is how the geometry works. So you're essentially going from west to east. And so it's not just for this eclipse, it's going to be pretty much for almost any the total solar eclipse or solar eclipses. That's just the geometry of the uh, of the event. Thank you, ma'am. And the next question is from Hanisha Arora. How do eclipses affect life? Happen that people get scared during this time. <laughs> you know, that's like a Pandora's box. Um, there's scientific evidence of how flora and fauna react, and we still get more information on that. Um, there's also a lot of superstitious uh, anecdotes and beliefs, including quite a few in India. If, uh, for example, there's a temple in Carbondale where I'm going to be. And so I went to the temple to ask what it is that they're going planning to do for the eclipse. 
And until then, I didn't realize. They said, sorry, they, we don't really, we, we do not observe the, we do not look at the eclipse, uh, so we do not participate in that. We're going to close the temple and we actually just meditate. And uh, that's when I started searching. And so there are all these uh, uh, things about, you know, what that you shouldn't eat food, you shouldn't eat cooked food, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't eat meat. You, if you're pregnant, you shouldn't be out. So, you know, there's a lot of um, you know rituals and anecdotes from all around the world that uh, are superstitious, just because uh, eclipses, just like comets, are considered uh, uh, harbingers of evil, uh, according to ancient customs, and that promote is promoted by those kind of beliefs. But you know, once the event is over everything is fine so it's just another event so i don't think there's anything danger for it um it's a beautiful event and it's a lab that we'll never be able to create on ground so it's nice it's a good time to have proper eye safety uh, apparel go out and enjoy it because uh, uh, nature is putting on a wonderful show that you cannot see otherwise thank you ma'am and our next question is from uh mukulika chatterjee if artificial solar eclipses could be brought out, uh, what would what is the possible possibility to control the temperature of the sun during uh, summer season? <laughs> wow. Um, well, if somebody can actually do that, I guess uh, you can pretty much uh, dial a temperature you want and maybe increase your growing season or increase your fall season. Uh, but I'm not sure that it could be done. It's uh, I, I'm not sure it may be in the futuristic uh, uh, idea, but uh, I mean, I do know there are space coronagraphs that are being used for various experiments and being designed. So uh, I don't think it is to control the temperature as much as to be able to uh, uh, um, obst uh, obstruct or uh, dis uh, cover an object that may affect a certain result. But if it indeed it uh, decreases the temperature, Yes, you could probably green the desert, the deserts of the world, um, you know. Uh, but, but the thing with that is, one has to be socially conscious too of whether how it affects the weather patterns and the balance of nature on Earth, because when you change and you have longer seasons in certain ways, some places, it may affect the uh, climate control, climate change, um, oceans. So there might be other uh, factors they have to think about. Thank you, ma'am. And one last okay, question. I think, uh, yeah, we can go to the last couple of questions. And uh, I'll just bring up one that, uh, you know, that's very relevant. We have by Eva from Indraprastha World School. What's the average duration of totality in a total solar eclipse? OK, well, the maximum duration is about a little over seven minutes. but And it can be as short as 30 seconds, uh, as recent uh, so that was measured in Australia, I believe. So it ranges from a few seconds to seven, uh, seven minutes, but the average is more around the order of two to four minutes. So right now, this one in, uh, in August is going to be two, hour, two minutes and 40 seconds max. And in 2024, it'll be four minutes and 20 seconds or so. So we do have a range, but again, not more than a few minutes. Yeah. Prabhu, we can take yes, the last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, one last question is, we have around uh, uh, 40 to 50 schools participating in this interaction, and each school has around hundreds of students. So we have more than uh, thousands of students who is watching this interaction. And I'm getting a lot of uh, superstitious questions about the solar eclipse. And also, uh, if you can tell um, how to watch the eclipse with safety, and as mm -hmm. well as if you can uh, break the myth the watching during uh, watching the total solar eclipse that would be great uh, like okay. a common answer for everyone you know i think the first thing is um, if you're watching it via internet and all that's fine um, superstitious wise i would ask people to think about that uh, superstition whether they get it from a temple their parents or somebody else after the event is over has their life changed because if there's if it has then the superstition gets more and more uh, uh, weight credit if it hasn't then it's just uh, 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 you know nothing to worry about really and the biggest concern and safety concern is eye safety 
That is, you know, you don't want to burn your retina by looking at the uh, eclipse directly. So it may not be this one, but there might be another one in, in India or somewhere else. And then you don't want to do that. And so the best thing that uh, I'm trying to look for here is a pair of uh, solar viewers. And that is what we are recommending. Excuse me. Let me see if I can find one. So like I said, NASA, NASA, Google, uh, my own company for that matter through a grant from uh, uh, an agency, as well as a lot of other uh, museums and all are pro uh, promoting what's called a safety uh, eclipse viewer. It's made with a film that is certified and the, the certification is here so that you know this is the appropriate film and it's extremely dark. So when you wear it, you first put it on and then you look at the sun you can see the sun uh, as a nice orange uh, blob, and you can even see features in it if you're, you know, you have the sharp eyesight. You can even see sunspots. But this is what you're supposed to wear to look at the sun uh, during sun. Uh, and, you know, it's only during totality you can take this off. You can see, look up up at the sun, and in the naked eye and look at it, and it won't harm you. But any other time. You need to wear these glasses and not keep them on too long either because they war they heat up. So and also before you wear them, you should always check to make sure there are no punctures or holes or wrinkles. So basically, if you sh uh, shine a, a bat uh, a flashlight, you will see bright dots if it's not if it's not safe with if there are holes in it, and they don't last more than a few years. So you don't want to be using old stuff again and again. But these are what you're supposed to be uh, using, and so. I'd say superstitious wise, please, there's nothing wrong in watching an eclipse. Um, if you have to, like if you're going to the temple and the temple is closed and you're supposed to stay indoors, that's fine. But use it to uh, think about uh, the eclipse or uh, meditate, I guess that's what they're supposed to do. But again, there's no harm in asking questions to understand the, the reasoning behind it. There may be some other reason, I don't know. Maybe they didn't have eclipse viewers in the days when the superstitions become rampant because it damages eyes. So it, those. The origin of superstition is something I cannot answer, but as far as scientifically as well as socially, do use solar viewers, and you know there are ways to get them or you can make them yourself. Uh, they're not very expensive; one has to buy them. If you're in the U.S. and participating, there are a lot of places where you can get them for free if by registering, going to a li local library, and also just l looking at the resources that have been researched and uh, promoted on the NASA website, where they promote eye safety, um, and you know it it tells you why and what what you should be doing. And so I think. Just having that awareness, and even if one or two people know about it and can start sharing it, I think it will uh, improve the situation. But again, there's, as far as I know, there is no um, science in the superstition. Thank you so much, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, we still have a lot of questions, so maybe we'll try to uh, pose it to you on Facebook or something like that okay. and try to get some answers. But it's been great having you here. And uh, you know we've all learned a lot about eclipses and leading up to 21st August, that's going to be a big thing for us. And hopefully we'll try to catch you just for a bite uh, on the day of action okay. uh, well, or later you. in the day after you guys have done the observation. So thank you. <laughs> right. And uh, thank you, Prabhu, for being here. And uh, you know, from India, some people had this question, we are not going to be able to see this eclipse at all, except for live streaming which we'll try, we will try to show on our space website. And we do have a total lunar eclipse next year, uh, yes. even in January and again in July. And we have an annular solar eclipse in 2020. So I think that's what we we'll look forward to. Yes. And hopefully some of you can travel uh, to the US to see it with, uh, with uh, you know, in the path of totality this year in August. So again, with that, thank you and have a great observation and solar eclipse oh, viewing thank you I, you know i want to just thank not only both of you but also for the interest that uh, you know you you guys put in a lot of effort to bring uh, this to this public and so even though i don't see the faces of all the students out there i really appreciate it and i'm very uh, happy to know that a lot of children are participating in uh, listening to this and again i would like to say even if you're not actually here to observe it. There are things that you can do. I mean, there are downloadable things. You can uh, uh, even even uh, uh, worksheets 
there are artistic uh, sheets where you can download and uh, create artwork and you can load that back to NASA websites. Um, also, if you have globe sheets or globe application on your smartphones, you can essentially add uh, data to the globe website, even if it's not in an eclipse, because of the same technique. And so that's citizen science. So you're participating in science in so many different formats. So I want to encourage everybody to see how they can participate. And if you're an artist, there are a lot of people who are just taking images from old images and producing their own artwork. So we're looking for artists also, you know, because you, you see some, sometimes they'll see structure that we miss. So there's so many ways you can participate. And if you want to send questions, please go ahead and do that. Or if you want, I, I can set up a Facebook page. You can just post your questions and we'll have people try to answer them. Uh, we have students working with us. So, you know, so there, there are a lot of students. In fact, one of the Kate is a high school student. So we have young people who are participating in Citizen Kate. So, you know, it, you just have to have the interest. And if you do, there's always an opportunity to participate. OK, thank you. And I just uh, want to correct myself that there is an uh, annular eclipse visible in 2019, as uh, Mr. C.B. Devgan points oh, out. OK. And uh, so with, I with that, that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so with that, thank you again, Padma. Thank you, Prabhu, for joining us and supporting it. And uh, thank you, all our viewers for being here with us today. And uh, in the coming days, we will be posting a lot on Facebook about the solar eclipse. Well, thank with you, Mela. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Take